Schaefer. I'm a professor of social work, public policy, and faculty director of Poverty Solutions at the University of Michigan. I want to welcome you to the Poverty Narrative Series, dedicated to a deeper understanding of poverty and inequality in the United States, and especially the Midwest. Our goal over the course of this series is to promote in-depth, impactful, and solutions-oriented coverage of poverty-related issue. We'll be broadcasting live every Tuesday and Thursday in June at noon. You can check out the full lineup at poverty.umich.edu. This series is supported by the Midwest Mobility from Poverty Network with generous support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. For those of you who signed up for our session, Lessons on Inequality During COVID-19 with Michelle Norris, I'm sorry that it was unfortunately postponed due to unforeseen circumstances, but we're really looking forward to announcing a rescheduled session soon and hope you can join us then. We conceived of this conference more than a year ago. Since then, a lot has changed. For instance, I'm broadcasting it from my basement. As is true with a lot of my work, this has led me to think about how the frame we chose originally might be too narrow. The coronavirus and recent acts of racist and unjust killings have laid bare inequality in health and safety in the United States and eroded economic security at a speed and scale unprecedented in living memory. These events have only further highlighted the role narratives can play and the importance of evidence, data, and storytelling. We start this conversation with a set of shared principles. People's stories are important. Black lives matter. The words we use shape meaning. And evidence has an important role to play. Now more than ever, we are committed to discussing the roles that both the academy and media can play in shaping the public's understanding of poverty, inequality, inequity, and vulnerability. Throughout my career as a public facing scholar of poverty, I've learned that media coverage of poverty can often shape opinions, attitudes, and policy preferences. What stories get told? How are they written? Whose voices are featured? We view this series as a way to connect journalists and scholars in a conversation about how to improve our storytelling and policy outcomes. So with that, I'm really excited about today's session, Rethinking the Poverty Narrative. Before we dig into it, I want to remind our viewers that we want to hear from you. You can submit questions in the comment box to the right on YouTube or on Twitter using the hashtag Poverty Narrative. We look forward to a meaningful conversation and we will try to get to as many questions as possible. We welcome an open and respectful dialogue and wanna let folks know that we will be responsive to any inappropriate content. In addition to hearing from our great panelist lineup, one of our goals with this series is to build a network of academics, researchers, practitioners, and journalists. I invite you to check out the resources, tune in for additional events, and find out other ways to connect with other poverty researchers and journalists at our website, poverty.umich.edu. So with that, I'd like to thank our panelists for joining me today and give them a brief introduction. Professor Derek Hamilton will be joining us shortly. He's the executive director of the Kerwin, oh, there he is. <laughs> He is the executive director of the Kerwin Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity at Ohio State University. I practice saying Ohio State uh, beforehand, so I wouldn't choke on it. He is a pioneer and internationally recognized scholar in the field of stratification economics, which fuses social science methods to examine the causes, consequences, and remedies of racial, gender, ethnic, tribal, nativity, inequality, and in education economic and health outcomes. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention he's also a fellow Oberlin graduate. He knew I was gonna say that before I did. Sarah Alvarez is the founder and executive, executive director of Outlier Media, which she started after years of trying to figure out how journalists could do a better job of filling information gaps and increasing accountability to low-income news consumers. And many times, I can, I can count a number of times when the work at Poverty Solutions 
has been driven in response to a Sarah Alvarez story. Zoe Greenberg is a reporter of the Boston Globe, which she joined in 2019. Previously, she worked as a researcher at the New York Times and an investigative reporter at Rewired News. Bill Nichols is a director of Spotlight on Poverty and Opportunity, which I, for one, have been following daily, and was the founding managing editor of Politico. During his 35-year journalism career, Bill has covered Washington and national politics, including 20 years at USA Today. As they respond to my questions and yours, I'm going to ask them to draw on their stories from their experiences and give concrete examples of when things have gone well and times when they feel like maybe things could have gone better. Income inequality in the United States continues to soar, and the coronavirus pandemic has put new strains on families experiencing hardship. More than ever, poverty and inequality is a factor in every beat in the newsroom. Whether you're covering city hall, national politics, education, or business and development. We'll be talking today about why it's so important to think critically about the narratives of poverty infused in our writings, the intersection of race and inequality, and strategies for impactful reporting that centers on the experiences of people with low income. Sarah, I'm gonna ask you to start us off. Tell us a little bit about what you think the role journalists have and to play in shaping the poverty narrative. Why does this matter in communicating with people with low incomes and communicating with more affluent folks about poverty issues? And how the answers to these questions have shaped your career trajectory. Hi, everybody. Um, it's nice to, to be here. I wish I could see you. <laughs> um, so I'm the, I'm the executive editor, not the executive director of Outlier. Candace Fortman is our fearless leader. Um, I think that the role that journalism plays in shaping the poverty narrative is too large of a role, honestly. And a lot of the reasons that I left my last job and founded Outlier was because I think that there is kind of an over-reliance on storytelling about poverty and not enough of service journalism that speaks directly to and um, with people who are experiencing that hardship. Uh, I think also that we have to be really honest about what an inspecific and intervention journalism really is, right? Like the idea that ideas and words and facts and documentation and some storytelling could actually like create change and improve conditions is um, crazy, right? <laughs> but it's something that we believe in. However, I think that we, that those of us who cover uh, low income communities and who report for low income communities would do ourselves and our work a disservice when we then like introduce high income folks into that equation and say like in order to create change in a low income community we need high income people to be able to advocate on behalf of those folks i think that that is sometimes appropriate but i think it's more often appropriate to try to to serve um low income news consumers directly with information that they could use to hold people accountable. Um, because I also think that <clears throat> poverty is an investigative story, in my experience. In my experience, the lack of resources in one community is um, balanced out by you know, more resources in another community. I don't see a lack of resources as a personal issue, right? It is usually a systemic issue and there's usually abuse of power on one end of it. Um, Wendy Thomas from uh, MLK50 says like poverty is a robbery. And I think that there is a lot of truth in that and something that I really want to, to look at. Um, yeah, so, so those are my thoughts. I can talk about how we 
how we decided to approach that. If you want me to talk about that now, or I can wait to talk about that. That'd be great. Why don't you uh, just give us a little bit of the story of, of Outlier Media? So the way we're kind of founded on the idea that we can fill in It looks like Sarah is frozen. Are others here? Yeah, okay. Great, well, we'll let her recover and we're gonna head over to Bill. Bill, could sure. you tell us a little bit about the evolution of media coverage when it relates to poverty and particularly when discussing shrinking newsrooms? Can you touch on the dominant racial and socioeconomic demographics of journalism and how that plays a role in shaping coverage? I can certainly try, Luke, and let me see if I can get my, uh, I've got a couple of slides to help me through this process, which hopefully everyone can see. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, great to be part of this conversation. Uh, I'm coming to you from uh, dark and stormy Washington, so if I make a sudden disappearance, it's nothing personal. Uh, but the thunderstorms have taken our power away, but hopefully it looks like it's cleared off a little bit. Um, so I, I will give uh, very briefly, and hopefully we can get back to Sarah, I, I'll give a sort of brief contextual overview. Uh, I think you've heard from Sarah, who uh, is doing some of the most important work uh, that anyone is doing in this space right now. Uh, but I wanna give some context to this notion of journalism about poverty and uh, we start where Luke did, uh, which is there's more need for this, whatever the format is, uh, than there has ever been. Uh, this is a list of just some of the topics uh, that need more exploration, more investigative journalism, uh, more contextual journalism. Uh, this is an old slide, slide that we've added uh, COVID to the bottom of and probably should be at the top. Uh, if anything, the last three months has, has put the issues that we all care about in, in even starker relief. But there's a collision uh, of, of two competing trends, uh, neither of which is positive. I'm gonna come around at the end of uh, this section to, to talk about a more hopeful note. Uh, but on the negative side, while we have more need uh, for coverage of poverty topics, uh, we have much less capacity to do so. Um, local coverage, and here I'm talking about uh, legacy media, uh, is virtually non-existent uh, at this point. Uh, this is an older slide. These numbers have sadly gotten even worse uh, in the last three months where you have seen what is really uh, an extinction level event uh, for state and local media uh, take part. Uh, and at Spotlight, uh, we did a survey a couple of years ago uh, looking at the 10 states with the highest poverty rate and looking at the 10 largest newsrooms in those states. And in each case, we found that there was not a reporter directly assigned to cover poverty. Uh, and the specific example I'll use, uh, as I worked there uh, in another lifetime many moons ago, uh, in Jackson, Mississippi at the Clarion Ledger, where I worked uh, in the early 80s when the paper won the Pulitzer Prize, there were over 100 people on the staff then. The last time we looked, there were 22, uh, and 11 of them cover sports. Uh, and that's in a state with a nearly 30% poverty rate where as Luke made the point, poverty should be at the center of everything they cover. I also sadly can't raise any, spec any expectations, and again, I'm talking about legacy media, that this is going to improve. Uh, the business model is broken. Uh, it's not going to get fixed. Uh, and I think beyond the economic pressures, uh, and we've seen this really once again rise to the fore very appropriately in the last few weeks, uh, the failure of legacy media, media to su sufficiently diversify uh, along gender and racial and ethnic lines. Uh, news organizations simply don't have the resources, if they have the will, uh, to fix that problem. And I also always also like to underline this is not just a lack of racial and gender diversity, though that is an extreme situation in legacy journalism. It's also a lack of socioeconomic diversity. Uh, which has such an impact on the telling of these sorts of stories. Uh, I'm the kid of a working class family in a small town in Kentucky. 
Uh, and I was pretty unique uh, in all the newsrooms that I worked in, uh, particularly once I got to DC. Even the media that has money uh, is having a hard time uh, doing a lot on this topic, relatively speaking. You are seeing great work by people like the New York Times, the Washington Post, Zoe at the Boston Globe and others. Uh, but given what's going on in the country, and again, everyone is seeing some diminution of resources, uh, it gets crowded out uh, when you're covering a uh, direct assault on the institutions of American democracy and now a pandemic. Uh, coverage of poverty topics tends to be pushed to the margins. Okay, now it gets to some better news. Uh, and you've already heard some better news from Sarah, who's doing uh, really revolutionary work uh, at, at Outlier. Uh, quickly, Spotlight has been around for a while. Uh, we're one of the, the older uh, outlets in this space. We've been around since 2007 uh, when we were founded to be uh, a way to, to bring more attention to policy, poverty po policy positions in the 2008 presidential uh, campaign. And uh, Spotlight has always been a nonpartisan, uh, nonprofit clearinghouse for uh, poverty news and policy. In terms of content, we've always uh, had a, a weekly commentary, uh, sort of op-ed. Uh, we also have a, a weekly newsletter that goes out to about 10,000 people in a really active uh, so social media operation with over 20,000 followers on Twitter. But when I joined, uh, as Luke referenced, after a zillion years in journalism, uh, I had the idea, even though I'd sworn to my wife that I would not get involved in yet another journalism startup at my advanced age, uh, to try to move Spotlight more into reported journalism about poverty. Uh, and we've done that over the last three years, uh, cobbling together are some small grants. Uh, we've done about 50 stories, uh, literally from Hawaii to rural Alabama, uh, using freelancers. Uh, of which there are all too many of uh, in, in today's journalism landscape, uh, to try to do stories that otherwise wouldn't get done. Uh, the idea being that we ultimately would like to do what Kaiser Health News does in the healthcare space for the poverty space. Uh, and that's being a source of free quality content on this topic uh, that newsrooms across the country can use. And here's some of the newsrooms that we've been working with. Uh, and this is a very important part uh, of our model. Uh, John Thornton, who founded the Texas Tribune and is the co-founder of the American Journalism Project, which is a major funder uh, right now in nonprofit journalism, likes to say that there are no more competitors in American journalism. There are only collaborators. Uh, that's hard for a dinosaur like me to wrap my brain around, but it is undeniably true. Uh, and in Spotlight, what we have tried to do is with any piece of journalism, we have tried to offer that to our partners, again, free of charge, uh, to try to uh, increase the reach, but also on specific projects uh, to co-publish, uh, to offer editing resources for uh, nonprofit newsrooms that may need it, when we can to offer financial resources to help get stories done uh, that wouldn't have already been done. And I want to note just a couple of uh, uh, ambitious projects that we were able to accomplish uh, at the end of last year. And I think it's an example of the sort of work uh, that can be done. Uh, we did a series with Education North Carolina uh, that looked at the uh, hurdles that community college students uh, in that state face in terms of food insecurity, housing insecurity, uh, the effects of extreme weather, uh, and then uh, uh, the most ambitious uh, set of stories that Spotlight has done uh, is a package called Poverty Next Door uh, that published in December of 2019. Uh, that's a project we did uh, in conjunction with Microsoft News that tried to directly look at this notion of the poverty narrative. Uh, the subhead uh, was us, not them. And that was the central theme of, of all the stories and long form videos that we did. So I'll turn it back over to Luke. but. Uh, the basic message that I want to convey is uh, obviously with the diminution of resources in local newsrooms, this is a really difficult time uh, for coverage of these issues that are so important to all of us. But you can look at any city in the country right now. Uh, Sarah mentioned Memphis uh, with MLK 50. You could literally go to any big city in the country and there's something exciting happening uh, in their nonprofit organizations that are 
in virtually every case, closer to these stories, closest to the closer to the people uh, who are living these stories. And I think the promise at this moment is also very great. Thanks so much. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Sarah, I'm going to kick it back to you. And uh, we got to hear a little bit about the history of Spotlight and Poverty and how it filled a gap and, and the sort of the role it's trying to play. So uh, take us back again uh, to the great work that you're doing. Sure. Um, and so we are kind of founded on the idea that because, like Bill was saying, because these resources are so scarce and it doesn't look like that's changing anytime soon, right? Um, how do we make a difference by using information and also conserve resources? So my work is um, based very strongly on Jay Hamilton's research, Jay Hamilton from, from who's now at Stanford. He was at Duke when I first learned about his work. And his work on information gaps and how information gaps really create these problems of a lack of accountability is what inspired me to start thinking about if you were going to try to design a news service for low income news consumers that that filled information gaps, like what would you do? How would you do it? So that's how we um, that's how we're built. And the idea is that by giving people it, um, valuable information about the issues that they've already said that they need help on and where there are resource mm -hmm. and accountability gaps, mm -hmm. that they can do a lot of the work with information that journalists are trying to do by like creating some kind of urgency around an issue. So for example, what we use is public data. In Detroit, we rely very heavily mm -hmm. on United Way's 2 on one data to really figure out what people are complaining about mm -hmm and what people are, um, are asking for help with. Mm -hmm. And then we, pre-pandemic, that was housing and utilities. We designed a service that gave people some of the information they said they needed the most, like who really owns their place? Is it at risk of mm -hmm. um, going into the tax auction? Because we're a city of you know, more than 50% renters, so a lot of people could have their house going up for tax auction and not know because their landlord didn't tell them, and yet they're the ones who have to deal with those consequences. Um, has it been inspected? These kinds of things. This is information that people can use to hold people accountable on their own. Journalists don't have to do it for them um, because we're not great at that. And also, of course, people wanna create accountability for themselves. And then we can focus our resources on these larger questions of abuses of power, like why, um, certain speculators are allowed to buy in the tax auction year after year, even though they should be disqualified under the treasurer's own rules. That's the kind of thing that we have to focus our resources on, but it's it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of money to be able to do that. And we're a very small um, newsroom with not a big budget. So it's really kind of based on this idea of like with limited resources and really respecting the power that these communities do have and want to exercise. How can you be of assistance and still do your job as journalists? Um, so that's that's our design. And anybody who wants to try it, we've redone our, our service now um, to incorporate everybody's needs around um, coronavirus and COVID-19. But all you have to do is text the word Detroit to the number 73224. To, um, to use our service. We use SMS because that's how people in Detroit want to receive their information because so many people have um, problems getting broadband access here. Thank you. Uh, Derek, I wanna uh, head over to you and thinking of you as a, a high profile public intellectual you have as much experience navigating the relationship between scholarship and journalism as anyone I know. So I wonder if you could tell me about your advice on how journalists and academics can work together to combat negative stereotypes often associated with people living in hardship. And when in your experience has a collaboration or a conversation between scholars and journalists gone well? When does it work well and, and when does it work not so well? Thank you, Luke. Uh, let me also say it's an honor to share the stage with uh, all of you. 
Luke, Sarah, Bill, um, gratitude for being here. Um, I want to start off with a couple of a couple of hijink facts that Oberlin was the last college in Ohio to beat Ohio State in football. And the last time that they played Michigan, guess who won? <laughs> and then you all got afraid and never renewed the game again. So that, that just want to point that out. No, um, in all seriousness, I would say that um, academics need to get out of their shell. Academics have to be willing to um, publicly engage and get beyond just talking with each other. Um, I think that that, that is crucial. Um, but you know, let me talk about some of the ways in which we can change narratives together in this current context. And you know, I'm going to lead with the fact that George Floyd could be killed in broad daylight by law enforcement for over approximately or about 10 minutes with a knee in his neck while screaming for mercy that he can't breathe. That has to be the result of a societal devaluation of black lives. I think that's vivid. The link, this links to a larger economic vulnerability and it, it links to the COVID moment that we're in. Um, it links to a public responsibility to poverty and economic insecurity that is very racialized. And it again leads back to this notion of deservedness or not. And that notion of who's deserving and not deserving, who's devalued or not, it impacts our fiscal response to poverty. We do not have an adequate social safety net in place. What we have is decades of deregulation, lower taxes for the wealthy, and a gutting of government resources, services, and social welfare programs. Our emergent conventional wisdom situates the market as a great, efficient, self-regulating, colorblind arbiter of all our worth, and it becomes the solution for all of our problems, whether they're economic, social, or otherwise. Over the past 45 years, though, we've had essentially all the economic gains from America's increase in productivity going to the elite and upper middle class. This is all manifest in a concentration of both not only economic power, but political power, where the top one-tenth of a percent of earners, those earning above 1.5 million, they own as much of our nation's wealth as the bottom 90% and the bottom 50% of earners own about 1%. This obscene concentration, especially by, wealth, by race and it's accompanying plutocracy and that's key, plutocracy, it's not democratic and it's dysfunctional and it leads to a distorted depiction of power and a material well-being. Um, but it has not always been our history. It certainly has not always been the frame of the Democratic Party. We can go back to the years of Roosevelt and we can argue that this neoliberal paradigm has been reactionary to egalitarian economic and democracy gains that resulted from the New Deal and civil rights movement. The neoliberal frame, and this is key, has shifted our public discourse to explain poverty and inequality as deficiencies internal to the poor and blacks themselves. We use race and we stigmatize race and anti-blackness in a strategic way as political fodder in order to discipline poor people. Blacks become the symbolism of what undeserving means. We characterize them as welfare queens, deadbeat dads and super predators, and we lead to a surplus population that's characterized as persistently unemployed, unemployable, a source of urban crime, malice, and whose subsistence needs are a drain on public budgets. That fuels austerity policy. If behavioral modification, particularly with regards to personal and human capital investments, if that's central, why should we fund government agencies and programs that not only misallocate re resources to those irresponsible individuals, but would create further dependencies and fuel those irresponsible behaviors. We have public-private partnerships that attempt to leverage private and charitable resources to manage and incentivize so-called defective black and brown people to get an education and be more employable. This is what we're up against. But what is glaringly missing from all these narratives and a role that media can play is to introduce the role of power 
and endowment and capital and resources and how those resources can alter the rules of transaction in the first place. We have a moral responsibility to contest empirically unsubstantiated rhetoric and instead conduct informed and bold scholarly and journalistic work that advocate for programs and initiatives that truly empower people with all the resources and structures that they need to be self-determining. Um, in the interest of moving forward with the panel, I could say more, but let me say that um, there is some hope. There is some hope when we see that various movements are coming together, whether it's Black Lives Matter, whether it is the Me Too movement, whether it is the response to the climate uh, impending catastrophes that are uh, coming up that we're going to face if we don't wean ourselves off, off of fossil fuels, to the extent that these movements are moving beyond the specific identity groups that are affected, but are talking about solidarity, we're pushing back on a frame that has cannibalized us into self-interested behavior and group investment at the expense of morality, at the expense of justice and sustainability. I think these ideals need to be part of what economic goals and goods need to be defined as. So I'll stop there. Derek, before I um, kick it over to Zoe, uh, I just wanted to say, as I was listening to your comments, I'm thinking about um, you bringing forward the role of values, the role of principles of what, uh, how things should be and what we want to live into as a society and the role of evidence. And I think about a lot of journalism as sort of thinking of themselves, you know, a lot of articles that sort of think of just reporting sort of the story, the facts without uh, any values. And I wonder if you could just speak for a minute about the sort of the interplay of all of those pieces. If you, if you think there should be an interplay or, or how those all fit together. Yeah, and I'm gonna say my discipline is largely responsible for creating an air of basically authoritarian, know, knowing what's good and what's best. And um, oftentimes that, that framing goes unchallenged. So, you know, I, I guess I, I refute a little bit the notion of a dichotomy between values and evidence. I think uh, what we end up with is hierarchical structures where we yield to some authority um, that is driven by economics becoming the hegemonic social science that, again, goes unchallenged. But it itself is grounded in a set of values to begin with. And the outcome that we define as success, as simply economic growth, that needs to be contested. If we're talking about a well-oiled well society, morality, as you pointed out, Luke, has to come in. It has to be part of not only our narrative, but what we determine as success. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, even in a place where uh, somebody's doing an article where they think there, there's no values or principles at play, what you're saying makes me sort of think there are values and principles because we sort of seeded those as sort of the backdrop, right? Uh, just a, a presumption, right? Yeah, those values just are treated as dogma. And right. somehow a faith. And there's the irony. The irony is that uh, what is considered positivist and fact-based is not challenged at a priori based on the ideological pinnings by which it began. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you. Zoe, uh, I'm going to turn to you. And we've heard a lot about the um, sort of the, the trends in the media at writ large. We've heard a lot about the intersection of um, themes across the academy and in journalism. And I'm wondering if you could turn to us, uh, just focus sort of inside on a story, right? Uh, and, and your experiences. Of course, one of my favorite stories that you've done was for the New York Times, what is the blood of a poor person worth? Uh, so you might use that as an example, but as I, I told all of, uh, all of the panelists feel free to you know do what i often do and answer the question you wanted to pick the story you want but you know what does that look like and you know just sort of on a micro level how do you reach out how do you connect with people and really try to 
give life to a complicated set of issues. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, it really is an honor to be on this panel and to be in this conversation. And I just wanted to start by going off of something that Derek said, which is, I think it's really true that these values that have long been held very closely in mainstream and some national news outlets are being contested right now. And it feels like it's this kind of moment of reckoning. Um, and you know, I'm thinking, so I, I used to work in the New York Times opinion section, which has undergone very huge change this week. And the editor and the deputy editor, well, one resigned, the other moved to a different section. And I always remember this moment when that, that editor was asked, you know, what are the values of the New York Times opinion section? And he said, you know, we're open to, we're open to all values, but I think mainly we're pro-capitalism. And I thought that really, um, that was kind of a insight into, I think, how a lot of these mainstream news outlets sometimes think about their reporting, which is that um, thinking as pro-capitalism as a as a neutral value, which I think really it really isn't. Um, mm -hmm. And so, I think that's that's really important to be thinking about right now. Wow. But um, I wanted to, I did want to talk about this this specific. Um, story, which is around the blood plasma industry and kind of focus in on that as as a way to think about how um, how we can do this kind of coverage and, and this kind of reporting. So I first um, became interested in this because I read that blood made makes up two percent of all um, all U.S. exports. And I was really shocked by that. That's a huge amount. And um, I thought, you know, wh whose blood is this that's being exported and who's profiting from it? So that brought up those two questions for me. Um, and I started talking with Luke, actually, who has done research and written about people living in extreme poverty um, who have turned to this as a way to bring in cash income. And I had seen that a lot of the media narratives around people selling their plasma kind of had this moralizing tone. It kind of was, it kind of was along the lines of um, this is an exploitative setup and it, it shouldn't happen it, and people shouldn't be doing it and are there ways to ban it? And talking with Luke and talking with other scholars um, and talking with people who were doing it and selling their plasma themselves, I became interested in kind of reframing the question, not as is this um, is this a moral thing to do and and should we ban it, but instead, you know, how is this being used as a survival tool in an economy that really isn't working for people, and are there ways that policymakers can think about how to make it a better survival tool in a broken economy, and so. As I was talking with, uh, when I was talking with people who were selling plasma, I heard this again and again, which was that, you know, people were using this money to buy food and they were using money to um, pay for transportation and they were using the money to pay for rent. And so it seemed clear that this was a survival tool and kind of delving into that more and reframing the reporting around that. Um, and I think what Sarah said earlier about how poverty is an investigative story is really so true. And I think that sometimes in mainstream um, in mainstream outlets, we focus on, so I guess I think about it this way, that inequality, there are people who suffer from it and there are people who benefit from it and therefore have stakes in maintaining it. And um, I think sometimes in mainstream reporting, we can focus primarily on those who suffer from it. And it ends up being kind of a baffling, um, it ends up being kind of baffling for readers because it's kind of like, huh, this system really doesn't seem to be working. I wonder why it's happening. Uh, and so I think focusing on those who are benefiting from it and those who are profiting from others being living in poverty is really important for journalists to kind of uh, create that, create that context. And so in the plasma reporting, that meant focusing not just on people who were making about $30 from selling their blood plasma, but also the corporations that are making millions of dollars from this and, and specifically placing these plasma centers in poor neighborhoods. So looking at both sides of that inequality to help portray that, that whole context. Wow. Yeah, and for me, I think uh, what Sarah said really struck a chord in terms of um, 
investigative story as well because um, it was only through the course of going out and getting to know families and different parts of the country that I even knew plasma was a thing. And then you discover that it is um, an incredibly profitable uh, industry and 70% of the world's plasma supply uh, comes from the United States and only 40% of the demand. And um, so it's really sort of driven by the, the blood of, of poor Americans. Hey, um, Sarah, I wanted to track back, you had mentioned the tax foreclosure, uh, sort of the work that you had done on tax foreclosure in Detroit. And that's something that um, my team at Poverty Solutions has also worked on. And uh, we've um, funded research. Uh, so Josh Rivera has done work on this and Josh Akers, understanding uh, all of these elements. And I think it's just really, um, it was, it's interesting because uh, in that case, I think uh, we provided research that was a part of understanding what was going on with that. And the University of Michigan also became part of the story uh, in terms of having been invested in some uh, companies that sort of use the tax foreclosure uh, market as a, um, uh, as a means to, to gain property and we're a part of sort of what is clearly a broken system. So I just wondered like, how do you think about um, partnerships and uh, a, a place like uh, the University of Michigan as a partner and also uh, potentially sometimes the subject of a, of a story that you might tell? Yeah, I forgot about that story. Um, <laughs> that that it's true that the University of Michigan, through its endowment fund, invested in a company that bought um, a lot of houses through the tax auction and then evicted the people who lived there. Um, so yes, also I would like to get on the record that oh my God, Zoe, I did that. That story is wild about about capitalism is the is the ethos yeah. of an opinion section and um i think that that's like really important to bring up about like kind of what we're up against as reporters not from necessarily an ideological perspective but from trying to even find the resources needed to do these stories well so um yeah we have benefited a lot from the research that that you all have done at Poverty Solutions. And again, because newsrooms have limited resources, it is really important to try to get um, to get some of that work offloaded to academics. And I think that, you know, I do really enjoy working with you all, even though we don't have like a very close relationship. We're both just trying to find the answers to these questions. And sometimes I think that, you know, what is challenging for reporters who cover these types of issues and who want to cover them in an investigative way is that there will be some interest in these issues for a short period of time but it takes a really long time to cover them. And so having, you know, having research that we can turn to, to be able to really uncover these things is very difficult to find because it's like people have moved on. And I'm sure that academia is not that different from nonprofit journalism where like funders lose interest in an issue and then like you don't get the answers that you need. So the tax foreclosure auction is a really good example because one of my biggest questions about the tax foreclosure auction, it's like my white whale is like, how much black wealth has been lost in the city of Detroit because of the tax foreclosure auction? I want that number. It's very hard to figure out what the methodology would be to do that. And journalists, as even, you know, if we're data reporters are not necessarily going to be able to do that work. But to not have that number means that our understanding of the tax foreclosure auction and the importance of it will never really match. Like the record can't be accurate if we don't have that number. Yeah. So as I'm uh, trying to internalize all of the incredible insights you all are offering, I think some of the things that I'm taking away is resources are scarce, are scarce. the capacity of newsrooms across the country, um, have declined and aren't getting any bigger anytime soon. And so collaboration really is gonna be key. 
and figuring out ways for the academy and uh, for journalism to partner is going to be critical. Uh, I'm thinking about how values are deeply embedded in any story that we that we tell. And so we should at least be cognizant of that uh, if we're in some sort of place where we think that uh, we should just tell the facts. W when are the values embedded in what we're doing uh, so deeply? And stories are relational, right? So I think this has come up a couple times. So when we have stories of poverty to just feature what's going on with uh, families in hardship, and this is a big piece of the puzzle. So I'm thinking about tax foreclosure in the city of Detroit, uh, families who are losing their homes, but also um, folks involved in the process and, uh, and what that means. I'm thinking of plasma and Zoe's point of not just focusing on those who are using plasma as a means to, to get a little bit of money, but what about the companies? So Bill, I wanted to turn to you and um, I wanna ask you a question. I'm gonna ask uh, Derek a question. And I think we might, uh, I'll, I'll start to look for uh, questions coming in from the audience. Bill, one of the things I, I really like about Spotlight on Poverty is the, um, the range of views, right? And the range of opinions that you, uh, that you present. And I just wonder, how do you think about that? How do you think about um, how you go about sort of setting up, you know, what goes out on Spotlight and Poverty and, and trying to, what are some of the things that you might try to balance uh, over the course of your coverage? Sure, thanks, Luke. It, it, we try to cast as wide, wide a net as we can. Um, I think the overarching goal for us, and this is a point that I wanted to make, I think was implicit in what everyone has said, is I think there is an increasing focus in journalism on solutions um, that was not always there before, was often not there before with coverage of this issue. Um, Zoe made reference to stories that were more framed in terms of looking at hardship, <clears throat> observing hardship, oftentimes stereotypically and very passively. What we try to do at Spotlight while being uh, as inclusive as we can is voices that possibly can make a difference. Um, that has in fact been challenging uh, in working with voices on the right uh, at this point. Uh, there are uh, organizations, there are individuals uh, that we probably wouldn't publish. Uh, because we feel like what they have to say doesn't fit our values or would not lead to productive dialogue. Uh, but we really do like to be uh, a canvas uh, where we can show that, and oftentimes, sadly, this is only outside Washington, uh, that there are bipartisan solutions uh, that are, are happening. Uh, there are people that uh, on both sides that uh, are expressing opinions that potentially can be joined into some sort of compromise. Uh, but I think this whole issue, uh, as Zoe made reference to, particularly in the last month or so, uh, is one that is raising tons of questions for journalists uh, in for-profit and nonprofit newsrooms, uh, the ideas of, of balance, uh, the ideas of objectivity. Uh, and just on that topic, I think too often we, uh, we confuse objectivity with fairness. Uh, I think objectivity certainly in the course of my career, uh, when I started as a reporter in the early 80s, I, there was still this pervasive notion that uh, legacy media was talking down to you. We knew more than you did. We were going to tell you what the story was and that somehow journalists were these priestly superhuman beings that actually didn't have opinions on anything, which is of course ridiculous. And I think uh, even the most hidebound uh, legacy newsrooms are moving away from that. Uh, maybe not as fast as they should be, but that's hard work uh, when it's a dogma that has dictated how you've done your job for so long. But I think you can still be fair while moving to uh, objectivity version 2.0 or 3.0 or 4.0. Uh, and by that, I mean when you're reporting about 
uh, an, an elderly man being harassed and knocked down by uh, Buffalo police. There's not another side to that. It, it happened. It's demonstrable fact. And fairness is describing that incident as it happened, mm -hmm. not somehow mm -hmm. trying to find uh, another side. Mm -hmm. So fairness and objectivity. Uh, Derek, I'm, I'm wondering if I can ask you to talk about, uh, I've been thinking a lot about the importance of bringing in the historical context of race, racism in the United States uh, into our understanding of what's going on, both on personal levels, but also the structural issues. And I've also been thinking a lot um, with the Black Lives Matter demonstrations and what's been going on and reading articles about that. And like wondering what lessons there are from the long arc of what's gone on in our country and how they relate to what we've seen just in the last two weeks. Yeah, thank you, Luke. Uh, first off, apologies to Zoe for not recognizing her when I came on, especially after that uh, brilliant presentation, <laughs> shame on me. Um, to answer the question, Luke, I'd say it's critical. I'd say that a, a historical understanding of how we got here is able to refute false narratives. Um, especially if we think about, you know, my work is grounded in race. So, it, you know, I understand that uh, the work of Ira Katz Nelson, who is a historian, for example, literally demonstrates that it was give outs, it was um, entitlements that built the white asset based middle class. Um, his book also is foundational in demonstrating that blacks were largely left out of that um, political infrastructure by both design and implementation. For example, it's not coincidental that when Social Security was passed, it excluded domestic and agricultural workers who, at the time, Black women who were working, 90% were, were working as a domestic or agricultural worker and over half of Black men. So that's a design issue that was racialized. Um, so if, if we're able to go back and look at history, we're able to refute some narratives that keep us from doing, um, in my opinion, what needs to be done to address poverty. And again, focusing on race, there's a lot of talk currently contemporary about reparations. And what I think reparations would entail is not only the redress, not only whether Black Americans get a check or Black Americans get a transfer of land or transfer of some means of production, but the first component has to be the truth and reconciliation. The truth and reconciliation of why we have such a gross wealth gap as Sarah alluded to today in, uh, in Detroit. The truth and reconciliation would not only restore dignity uh, so that we don't have to talk about a population as being deficiently deficient in some aspect. In the beginning, we talked about biology deficiencies among Black people, and now it has evolved to cultural deficiency. Somehow they engage in detrimental attitudes and norms. But the truth and reconciliation would clearly define the ways in which Blacks have been denied the opportunity to amass capital and pass it down from one generation to next, and government's complicit role in that. And in fact, when Blacks were able to amass capital, it was subject to terror. That history has to be told not only for black people, but for poor people in general. As I mentioned before, we racialize poverty. We other white people, I'm not the first to say this, but the term white trash is, is meant to distinguish poor white people from some sort of norm of what white people are. So I think understanding history, understanding race, these are critical ingredients. And I want to say two more things real quick. One is, um, I think everybody on the panel agrees that journalism and research is grounded in values, that there's, it's nonsense to think that somehow all of this is positivism, that there is some values. I hope we just own up to those values. And then the other point I wanna make is, it's beyond capitalism what we're talking about. It's beyond uh, the notions of what we learn in our textbook e Econ 101 
because it's capture of our political infrastructure as well. It is capture of our political infrastructure. It's capture of our media. Corporations have captured media, have captured the academy, and have captured the political infrastructure to not only allow a laissez-faire market interaction, but to structure the rules of the game in their favor to begin with. I think we have to combat that entire narrative of capture because right now this concentration is anti-democratic. And, and the last thing I'll say, and I know I'm rambling on, is from a change perspective, we need to present alternatives. We need to show that um, there is a different way that can work. Um, and I think history allows us to, to demonstrate that as well. I think that the neoliberal moment that we're in is reactionary to some of the egalitarian gains that came about, not just from a new deal that uh, provided a white asset-based middle class, but even some of the gains from civil rights. And in fact, I had this conversation with Bill previously offline. Um, it was the gains to black people from civil rights that might have provided the fuel to uh, create this neoliberal movement by using race as the political mechanism by which they could uh, produce these narratives. Thank you. I, uh, I'm going to take the first question from the audience, but I'm going to reframe it just a little bit. I'm wondering if we could just go around uh, to each of you and um, just maybe try to give an example or a um, uh, sort of a thought on when a story, when you might see a news story and think, you know, that, that story really did a good job with the narrative on poverty and inequality sort of really you you know was part of a narrative that led to a deeper understanding among readers and when do you think you know what might be the hallmarks of a narrative in that story that you think that maybe missed the mark or fell into old stereotypes uh that have pervaded media in the past. Zoe, if you're ready, I might kick it over to you because I haven't heard from you in a little while. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Um, well, one of the stories that I always look to as kind of a model for this is um, a, a piece Matthew Desmond wrote about the mortgage interest tax deduction. And I, I think of that as such a really um, useful model for how to do this kind of reporting right, because it's about uh, what choices our government has made and we as a society has made about who to subsidize in our society and who not to subsidize. And so it really takes the issue out of individuals um, not being evicted or, or uh, being homeless, but instead focuses on the policies and on those who are benefiting from the policies. And so I always try to think about, you know, in whatever issue I'm covering, how might I be able to think about it with that kind of lens? Um, I think in terms of the hallmark of stories that maybe doesn't get it quite right, I think sometimes, sometimes I think it can be useful um, Sometimes I can see what's gone wrong when I see readers' reactions. Like um, I did a story with another reporter at The Globe about families who are living in homelessness during um, coronavirus and what kind of struggles they were having. And responses poured in from people asking to buy a laptop for one of these women, which is great. And we, uh, I think she got a laptop, which is great. But also, um, it made me think, you know, people are responding to this, wanting to help this one person. And I think that's, I think that's generous and people want things to be right. But it also made me think, you know, maybe something about the framing of this story made it seem like this is um, one person or something that can be solved by um, giving money to this one family, as opposed to thinking more critically about how we might um, change the system that, that yeah. creates it. Yeah, I'm going to stick with you for just a second because the next question that just came up um, sort of said, uh, um, without education, individuals can maintain a privileged view on something like donating plasma. What other resources besides blood could be given to gain $30? And 
And that sort of made me think about something that Bill said uh, about sort of a turn to solution-based journalism. And, mm -hmm. and where would there be a place in a story like the one you just described to say, here are some, here are some policy responses mm -hmm that could address the bigger picture issues affecting these families. Because I think a lot of times people, they don't know what to do. Uh, and so they might reach out. Um, mm. So, you know, when, when can we have uh, in the story sort of a discussion of those solutions? Yeah, I'm glad you said that because I wanted to comment on what Bill had said as well, which is that, um, I think that's really true. And people often write to me after stories asking, you know, what can we do? And one of the things that I think is useful to do as a journalist is to kind of raise up, um, raise up resistance and creativity that's coming from low income communities. So like another example I'm thinking of is I'm working on a story right now about tenant organizing that's happening in this moment where people don't have money and, um, are at risk of losing their homes. And I think there's two ways to tell that story. One is that, um, Lots of people are losing their homes and they're going to be uh, thrown out onto the street. And I think another way to tell that story is that people are actually organizing, you know, for the first time within their buildings to try to negotiate for each other in solidarity and to um, kind of rethink how, how their housing works so that none of them will be kicked out of their housing. So I think there's ways um to focus on solutions. And in that case, I wonder if readers might say, how could we support this tenant organizing as opposed to how could we send money to one family so that they're not kicked out of their home? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sarah, uh, I want to turn to you with this question of um, when, when do sort of uh, stories about poverty and inequality, uh, structural inequalities, sort of live into a narrative that sort of deepens our understanding and, and when do they not? And any sort of examples of one way or the other? Well, sure. I'm gonna take two examples just from the last like couple of days, um, just because it's what I'm thinking about. Yeah. Um, there okay. was a story today, um, also this is like a story that I would very much like to continue reporting on. There was a story today about how like the question is like, why are DTE and consumers energy being approved for rate increases at a time when their residential customers who already pay the highest proportion of, of their, you know, like residential rates are much higher than industrial or commercial rates. So like why are residential rates, why have they just been approved for a residential rate when they have shareholders? Like why are resident, like, people in Detroit being asked to bear this burden when their shareholders are not being asked to bear this burden. That's a good story because that's about like who mm -hmm. is involved. Mm -hmm. And it's not just like mm -hmm. people can't afford their electricity. Mm -hmm. So I thought that that was like a very good example. And it is framed very much as like a business story, which is interesting. Um, and I, I don't think that that's bad, but I think it's true about kind of like this theme of, um, who can afford to pay for their their basic needs is like through everything, right? Um, so I thought that, that was a good story. On the other side, I would say that I've seen a lot of bad stories about the unemployment system in Michigan and taking the state's word that there's like rampant fraud in the system mm -hmm. when they refuse to present numbers to us as reporters that say, what those numbers, like how many people who have these stop payment notifications um, have actually been judged to have committed fraud and how long is it gonna take? And why is this the case, right? Why is this happening? Um, so I think that those stories that say there's massive unemployment fraud and the state is doing its best, I don't understand why that story exists. We don't know that that's true. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things I'm hearing uh, from both responses is stories that sort of look at a bigger sort of slice of the world and trying to understand what's going on with hardship, right? And looking, um, uh, you know, not just doing a story about people falling behind on their energy bills, but doing a story on the system of providers and what's going on with them at the same time. 
not just doing a story about a family experiencing homelessness, but trying to understand the sort of the bigger structures that led to that homelessness or are in place to to address it as a hallmark. And and to me, you know, that's um I I just recently in my class sort of started having a uh, a uh, a section uh, called when social policy when the most important social policy issues aren't social policy or something. Yeah, I haven't quite figured out what the uh, the term is. But talking about things like auto insurance and access to dental care uh, and uh, tax foreclosure as issues related to um, poverty and inequality. Uh, and sometimes the most interesting stories are there. Bill, um, I'm going to uh, turn to you. Uh, actually, let's, this is, uh, I'm really enjoying these answers. So I'm going to go through, uh, I'm going to go through everybody. Bill? Yeah, sure. Well, um, an example of a story that, uh, a positive example, I'll, I'll, I'll use one that we did at Spotlight. Uh, this is one, actually one of the first stories that we did in our, our journalism project, looking at uh, the reemergence of hookworm uh, in rural Alabama. Yep. And I think we can all imagine a bad way to do that story and uh, a way that that story would often be done, which would be a very passive, exploitative, uh, observational story about uh, largely African-American uh, communities uh, living in dire income inequality. Uh, but we tried to flip that and do it, uh, as Sarah indicated in her opening remarks, in a more investigative way. Uh, why is this happening? Uh, it was because there was horrifically bad sewage uh, services to this area. And what could be done about it? Uh, I mean, you do want to document uh, the conditions that people are living in, but that's a springboard for trying to find a solution uh, to make that better. Uh, the other example that I would use, uh, I was thinking during Derek's opening remarks, uh, those the three stereotypes that, that he mentioned, the welfare queen, super predator, the deadbeat dad, those weren't just created by race baiting politicians. Uh, Legacy media uh, played a major role in uh, the uh, spread and the creation and the dissemination of those sorts of stereotypes, often unwittingly, uh, usually because there were uh, a table of white men who were making decisions about headlines or photo placement or uh, how a story would be uh, reported. Um, so while I agree with Sarah that uh, journalism certainly isn't the sole answer to changing the poverty narrative by any means. I do think it's part of the answer because I think it was a significant part of creating the problem that we have. Hmm. Well put. Derek, I'm gonna to turn to you. Sure, I mean, I, I think uh, in thinking about bad stories, Bill hit it out the park when he talked about the equal size phenomena. When something is clearly um, right or wrong, but the, the desire to try to give equal footing, that's very problematic. I also think a, a lot of, uh, uh, from personal experience, sometimes journalists have engaged me. And what academics can do also in the engagement with journalists is sometimes highlight the big ideas, try to uh, really hone in on, on what things mean in a succinct manner. Well, I've had some experiences trying to highlight the big ideas and then realize sometimes after the fact that uh, the goal was to get a sound bite, even if you tried to uh, dissuade from a certain angle that, that you knew was not correct, it, but they it was a, a goal to get a sound bite to go with a story that, that they were intending to produce. Um, in terms of uh, positive stories, two recent ones. One was Michelle Alexander's op-ed in the New York Times, I think, and the other was Kianga Yamada Taylor's essay in The New Yorker. Both of them were brilliant in defining this moment. And the things that made them brilliant were related to the question that uh, Luke asked me uh, previously about a historical context. So they were thinking about this contemporary moment of unrest that we're in, of um, even the pandemic, 
um, but they contextualize it in a long history. Um, in general, if we want to understand an analytical frame of what's going on today, if you don't know history of how we got here, you'll come to different conclusions. You'll interpret a set of events out of context, and you very well may it very well very well may lead you to your priors, which are inaccurate. But big shout outs to both Professor Taylor as well as um, Michelle Alexander, because those essays framed this moment in a way that uh, included our political evolution, our historical underpinnings, and it was able to allow us to think about what's different about this moment, what's the same about this moment, and, and can really uh, give us a complete understanding and it's empowering. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Karen, who's our project manager, who's done such an incredible job of, of organizing all of us together to uh, see if we can get those essays included in sort of materials for the conference going forward. Hey, we've got a, uh, a great question from the audience. Uh, premise of this discussion is that more stories are needed and have value and that they should draw on the experiences and the, 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 the stories and the perspectives of, of those who are marginalized. How can we compensate communities for sharing and helping in this dissemination? I'm gonna throw it open. This will be my first try just throwing it open and seeing what you all do. Uh, you know, if you all talk at once or if we have to sit for a few minutes. I, I, I think the there's like, there are examples. I mean, there is, so um, there are examples of ways that you can compensate people for sharing um, their expertise and their time, um, even if they don't work full time for your news organization. And in, in news organizations, um, compensation can get tricky ethically. So it is something that you should think hard about, but it's also- Can you, can you talk about that? Well, ethical complication. So as reporters, we're not supposed to be compensated by there's supposed to be like a firewall between the business side and the reporting side. So reporters should be insulated from knowing who the advertisers are and from being compelled to promote their interests. I am not saying that this works, but that's supposed to be the idea. And then um, on the other side, like you're not necessarily supposed to compensate a source for um, for speaking with you. It's like a quid pro quo that you're not supposed to do. So there's a lot, of, but there are a lot of ways that you can um, that you can get around the uh, this using that ethical um, that ethical framework, which makes a lot of sense from like keeping you from compensating people for their expertise and time in a way that is appropriate. So like City Bureau in Chicago is an organization that has a program called Documenters and they pay people for their time um, to document meetings in city meetings and municipal meetings and to also do like research tasks associated with those meetings. We do information needs surveys um, where we're just asking people, uh, you know, what their challenges are and what information might help them meet those challenges. They're very quick, they're over text message. We compensate people for completing that survey. Um, you can also play, pay people as like op-ed contributors because it's very, very useful to have people speaking for themselves. And then we can also, you know, not, um, not rely on ourselves for, uh, to be a translator, you know, necessarily. So we also compensate people um, for writing like what we then label as, as editorials. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of ways to do it. Those are three that I know of. I don't know what you guys think. That's great. Derek, it, it looked like you had. Yeah, that was great. Oh. <laughs> I, will, I will just add that um, I think that's really true. And I think exactly what Sarah said, but I do, I have come upon this as an issue in reporting because, um, you know, I, I do ask people to spend a good amount of time with me and to, share their story and to, uh, you know, it takes up time and labor to do that. And because of our ethics policy, I don't pay them for that work. And I've had people, you know, say like, I'm, I'm not 
you know, like, what am I going to be paid for this? And I feel like I have to have just an honest conversation saying, like, these are the ethical concerns around paying people for information. And um, I'm not going to do that. And I want to be sure you understand that. And if this isn't something you want to participate in, you know, you don't have to. But I think that it is a really tricky question. And there's not, I haven't found like, um, a perfect solution for it in terms of using up people's time and labor when I'm reporting. You know, actually the other day, I forgot about this, but it was interesting. So we don't have our own publishing platform. So we publish with, you know, local and national outlets and they all have their own rules. We did a story about unemployment and it was published by Bridge Detroit, which is a new, um, a new publication here in Detroit. And one of the people who was in dire straits because of this unemployment fraud flagging, um, they put his cash app number at the bottom of the story. And that was, I thought, really a good way, because people do ask, like Zoe was saying, like people will get in touch and say, yep. how can I help that person? So I had sent the editor like, hey, if anybody asks, because I'm going to be off, like this is this guy's cash app. And they put it at the bottom of the story. And I thought, wow, why haven't like we ever thought of doing that before? I don't, I don't feel, I thought that that was like a really, um, you know, elegant way of, of, of mm -hmm. saying like, we know that people will want to support this person. Yeah, we, we did that as well. Uh, and it, it, it is, I had the same thought as Sarah. It's something that <clears throat> had sort of been frowned on for stupid reasons. Uh, but I think makes perfect sense with the package that we did with Microsoft News. Uh, for almost all of those stories, we had uh, potential uh, places that people could donate money to that would either help people specifically who were named in the story or to help uh, on the issue that the story addressed. Uh, an example is uh, one of the video pieces we did uh, looked at uh, some efforts to try to boost uh, young entrepreneurs of color uh, in Philadelphia. And so there were some specific uh, programs and organizations that were doing that work. And I think that's perfectly journalistically appropriate and at least does something to follow through uh, to try to provide help to the people who are, uh, as several people have said, are spending an enormous amount of time helping us do this work. Yeah, yeah I mean, my, my answer is, is more broad and macro in that use the craft of media to empower rather than extract or exploit. So that, that's not specific to the individuals, but um, you're, it's obviously a powerful medium that can empower communities and people in uh, profound ways. Hey, so as I'm thinking about some of the questions that people might take uh, as they enter into their stories, I've got a, a question of why is this happening and not just trying to look at a person's circumstance, but everything around it, and especially bringing in the history, uh, as Derek said, and then what can be done about it, and thinking about different policy solutions and not expecting any particular article, I think, to do all the policy analysis to figure out what the right one is, but to offer some, some different uh, opportunities, right? Some different ways uh, that people might address. So I think our audience is, has got that in mind too. So I wanna spend the last 10 minutes talking about solutions. And our, our first one, I'm gonna start with Derek and then, uh, and then invite others to, to chime in too. So you spoke about the first step to reparations as being uh, truth and reconciliation. And I wonder if you could offer sort of any other thoughts on how would that be done well? Are there organizations in the United States that you think are are sort of forwarding a move towards truth and reconciliation in an effective way, or some sort of some of the steps that might take us down that path? I mean, there's certainly scholars who have looked into this, a wide range of scholars. I think ultimately, and by the way, when I look down, it's because of the shock of seeing my face. <laughs> 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 I, I think uh, the grounding of a reparations commission first has to have the authority and the sanction of a governing body uh, like the U.S. Congress, like an executive order that empowers them, or philanthropy itself can get together, or even media, but it needs some 
authoritative functioning to say that you are the experts and we will pay attention to what you find. And then how you fill that commission, you would do it just like we do with other commissions. But we, you know, the 9-11 commission doesn't, you know, I'm not one, again, I, I channel Bill's comment about in the issue, in the interest of getting both sides, you don't want to miss the point. So uh, whether it's bipartisan or not, that's not a criteria for me. But you get the learned experts from different angles to come together and really do the analysis, both historical, narrative, and analytical, to really identify the harms and come up with the redress. I um, mean, then really quick, the other question that was asked about um, media and how can we affect change? You know, just like poverty, these are structural issues, not individual issues. And to me, the biggest obstacle is power and money itself. Power and money itself wants to consolidate and maintain itself. Capital does what it does best. It iterates and concentrates. So coming up with a solution that democratizes that power, I think is critical. Perhaps there are new technologies that allow for, for example, academics can go right to um, the public themselves with Twitter and social media now. That's a form of media. I mean, they're, they're, we, we have well-meaning journalists, but that might get caught up in a power structure that limits their power. I think to attack the problem, we need to think structurally of ways to democratize information in a way that can be powerful. Mm. Hmm. So um, let's talk about uh, in the poverty and inequality space, there are a lot of different uh, policy solutions on the table, right? So uh, uh, one of our audience members brings up trying to weigh microloans that promote entrepreneur entrepreneurship move away from predatory loans as an option. Another option they bring up is a $1,000 a month universal basic income. Hmm. Since I have a horse in this particular kind of race, I might say a child allowance or perhaps baby bonds that uh, affect you know universal, but also uh, a policy that would redress racial inequality within its structure. So how do folks go about the sort of weighing of these of these different options? Or is that even you know, something that the media should do or uh, that we should be doing at this stage? I can take that. And I, I think the universal basic income example is a particularly <clears throat> interesting one uh, at, at this moment. Um, I don't think we should be weighing them, uh, and I'll use UBI as an example. Uh, we've probably done a half dozen stories about UBI over the last couple of years in one aspect or another, and if we were weighing that at the time on the likelihood that universal basic income was going to be instituted, certainly on the national level, uh, we wouldn't have run those stories. Uh, because uh, UBI was viewed, I think, by the establishment in Washington, and actually a number of people on the left uh, as a sort of crazy idea that would wreck the existing social safety net uh, and was uh, a bridge too far. Um, I think that the impact of journalism about UBI has resulted in the current moment, and the pandemic has obviously had a lot to do with this, but all of a sudden UBI doesn't seem like such a crazy idea anymore. Uh, and there are politicians talking about it who I think three months ago wouldn't have. And I think journalism about that policy helped set the stage for there to be a more rational discussion uh, about something that I, I think increasingly a lot of people feel makes sense. And I think had we made an editorial judgment about ah, UBI, that's never going to happen. We're not going to write about it. We would have been wrong. You know, one thing that I don't, I mean, I don't do a lot of policy analysis uh, work and I, I don't do a lot of explanatory journalism in general, but one thing that I feel like uh, I have seen a need for is shorter form explanatory journalism. And again, I think, you know, 
giving people credit for wanting to understand these ideas who are impacted by them means that the explanatory journalism that goes into this needs to be also aimed for the people who are most affected by it. And I just think that we just don't seem to have a lot of tools um, that are explanatory and not long form. And that's a frustration that I have felt for a while, but I've seen it in particular with the um, with the coronavirus and the need to explain very complicated things to people who have a lot to deal with and who have like very high cognitive loads. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, I, I begin with my values to answer this question. Mm -hmm. From a values proposition, I believe that the government needs to exercise public power or provide public options at a base level if we want to, so that people will not be vulnerable to exploitation and extrapolation for from a for-profit system that is motivated to make profit. And that profit may entail exploiting people, not for any, that's not a moral judgment, that is what they do. So the fiduciary responsibility of firms is to their shareholders. The fiduciary responsibility of government should be to the American people. And that's why I'm for an economic rights frame that provides public options. And that fits into this question. You know, if we started off with microloans. For me, the big issue is public finance so that people can have, you know, public banking or some access to credit and not be at the whim of a private sector that will aim to exploit them because they don't have the economic resources to compete. Um, thinking about UBI as a policy, I'm all for guaranteed income. I'm all for a set base level of income so that people can have agency in their lives. I like the economic security projects framing. I like uh, Luke's uh, child allowance, but there's a problem for me from a implementation stage of UBI because UBI giving everybody in the economy $1,000 is almost the definition of inflation. It becomes inequality enhancing because by definition, if you're poor, you consume. And if you're wealthy, you're subsidizing the investment of those that are wealthy that can lead to greater, greater inequality. And I understand that the UBI advocates talk about using the tax code as a, as, a, as a backhanded way to come in and address inequality, but that would be an inefficient use of the tax code. So I'm for guaranteed income. And the last point I'll make is that we don't have to be in the frame of scarcity and thinking about one silver bullet policy because there will be no one silver bullet policy. Even if we have guaranteed income, that leaves people vulnerable to um, the banking sector. If you don't have a bank account, when we sent out the $1,200 checks as a result of this stimulus, you may not have gotten your check to date. So we also need everybody to have an account in our society. We also need jobs. I'm for federal job guarantee. Um, we can obviously we would deter the conversation if we talk about how we finance it. I, I, I have an answer to that. But ultimately, we need a package of goods that ensure every American has the adequate resources that they need to thrive. Political rights and civil rights are not enough without economic rights. Zoe, I'm going to give you the last word. Yeah, I'll just say um, even broader than any specific policy that we advocate for, that we write about in, in our journalism, I do think it's interesting to note how much mass movements and how much people kind of taking to the streets actually changes how we tackle these issues and how we narrate them. Like I'm just thinking at the Boston Globe, we now have a, a number of reporters looking into what it would mean to defund the police, which is definitely not something that we had about two weeks ago. And so it is just interesting and important to note that um, what we see as possible to write about or to investigate, I think is is partly um, affected by these, by these movements. I think that's a great place to end. So, Zoe, Bill, Derek, Sarah, I just want to thank all of you for what well, was a really incredible session for me, and I've learned a lot, and I hope that we've given our listeners some very concrete ways that um, they might think about as they go about their work, both in the academy and in the media. 
So thanks to you all, and we'll look forward to continuing this conversation in a variety of ways. Thank you, Luke. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> thanks so much. Take care, everybody.